uh, I believe God has great things in store for Broken Chains. I believe He has great things in store for me. I believe that uh, we're on the cusp of some awesome things. Yes. And uh, I believe, you know, we have we have a lot of ministries that's flowed out of this house. And I believe God is about to start this birthing things. And some of you are even experiencing birthing pains right now. And don't just focus on the, you know, uh, ladies when they're in pregnancy, you know, now, you know, sometimes, I mean, I've got the look, I've had my hand squeezed, you know, I've got the don't talk to me right now, you know, I don't need encouragement, shut up, you know. <laughs> Now it's not the time to preach, preacher. <laughs> you know. But you know, after that little bit bundle of joy is is born, you don't you really don't think about the pain no more. That's all of you no. Know, some of you ladies may not know that. I'm not trying to bring up hard things. I'm some of you are waiting. But what I'm trying to say is, you're probably not even going to remember a lot of things you're going through right now after the season has passed. But the enemy will always wants you to focus on the pain, on the obstacles, what's in your way. And I want to talk a little bit about that this morning. And uh, I want to talk about how, you know, being, being human and still being a super Christian. Now, listen, you can't be a super Christian. You're just never going to do it. But you can't add Jesus super to your natural and become a supernatural Christian. Amen. And everybody in here maybe have tried to be a super Christian once and you've tried to force yourself to do all the right dance at all the right times. And I'm sure you figured it out by now, you'll fail at that. And you'll come up short, and then the enemy will beat you up, and then you'll just have a horrible time. And we're going to talk about being human and dealing with those things this morning. And uh, what to do whenever you don't always act like you want to. I know nobody in here has ever done that. Other than me. Nobody, right? No, okay, I thought so. You know, as a, as believers, we have things other people don't have. But, you know, the Bible says out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks, right? And it goes from our mind to our heart and then out of our mouth. And right now, in the last days, there is a battle for your mind every day when you get up. And when you really start getting close to God and seeking God and chasing after God, the battle actually intensifies for you, especially when you're about to burst something because He wants to get you to curse your own seed because He can't do it. He wants to get you to throw in the towel to say, well, that's never going to happen. That's a pipe dream. Or I can't even be that person. Now, we're going to talk about being entangled. Galatians chapter 6, I believe verse 19. Pull it up there in a minute. But the Bible says, do not be entangled again in bondage. Now, when I first got saved, I thought I was... I first thought, when I thought of entangled, I thought, man, I'm doing good. I'm not drinking, smoking drugs, cussing, or any of the above. And as long as I'm doing that, I'm a okay. And at that season, that was probably right. I mean, that was quite the accomplishment for me at that time. But as we go on with Christians, we think of being entangled, we only think of the big things. And I've come to find out, you know, entanglement means getting something that twists it up, that perverts you, that, that trips you up. But actually, let's just go to the definition here. So I don't misquote it. Out of the Webster's. To wrap, to twist together, to interweave, to ensnare, to involve in a perplexing or troublesome situation. And then it also uh, means... Uh, a complicated or comprising, compromising relationship or situation, an extensive barrier made of barbed wire stakes erected to uh, trip you up and entangle you. Now, how many know the enemy has many traps? And every day he is he he fires fiery darts in your head. Now, a lot of times the thoughts that you have are not even your thoughts. You'll be wrestling you. Know, Anybody ever wrestled resistant against sickness? 
as soon as you do everything the doctor said, everything coming on, everything, you, he, he, see, the enemy is, he, he's, he's an angel of light, and he takes the truth and he perverts it. So he'll take, so take something that has truth to it, and then he'll shoot that in your head. And the whole thing he's after is your faith, your confidence, and your hope, where you're confidently anticipating. Come on. I'm going to talk about some other things too. But right here, we'll talk about this. So he will come at you. He will try to get you engaged because his whole thing is to entangle you and trip you up, and to get you to act out of character that lines up with the Word of God, and to get you in a relationship with something outside God. You know what? That can even be your temper. Anybody ever got frustrated? You know, those frustrations didn't just usually happen. They're because thoughts were put in over and over again, and you started thinking about. Sometimes it's sometimes things are really unjust, but you know the best the, the best way to mess up something God's about to get justice in is for you to get mad about the injustice. Nobody's ever been there, right? <laughs> How about anybody just plain just get frustrated? Did you know that you can't stay mad at somebody without rehearsing what they did to you? That's why the Bible says in Philippians 4, 8, take on these things. Everybody knows the verse by now. I've quoted it a million times over the years. Where things are lovely, where things are pure, where things are just, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Amen? So, but when you get, anybody ever just get up and you have a day where there's just an onslaught from hell and you're like, man, I feel like I'm wading through barbed wire. And, Maybe you haven't done anything, but the whole purpose is the enemy has this whole thing set for you, and his whole desire is to entangle you. Now, in Galatians uh, 6, you can go there for a minute. Uh, oh, Galatians 5, sorry. Galatians 5, we're going to start in verse 1. It says, Stand fast. Can you all hear me all right? I'm going to project. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free. Now, how many know that God wants you to be free? Amen? Amen. Amen. But He said, stand fast. See, that means you have something to do with it. Are you all with me? Mm -hmm. How many know that whenever Jesus said it's finished on the cross, He meant it? He went down, He got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. He defeated and made a show of him openly. Come on, I'm about to start preaching this morning. Come on. It's Independence Day, and I'm not preaching a freedom message because independence. I felt like this is what the people that were coming today needed to hear from God. And so, but you know what? When the Bible says, when you've done all to do, stand. What are you standing on? The promises of God. That they're yes and amen. The devil tells you, well, why are you even trying to get your attitude under wraps? You know you always mess it up anyways. I, don't know. I, I am made in the image of Christ. Don't tell me I can't do that. That guy is dead. Behold, all things pass away. Behold, all things become new. I will not be a jerk today. I will crucify my flesh. That means you take it out and you nail it on the cross. That means you recognize what it's trying to do and you say, flesh, not today. Sometimes you're talking to Satan when it's your own flesh that needs to be talked to. People are saying, not today, Satan. He said, I didn't do it. I just got you to do it. Come on. Not today, flesh. You're getting crucified. You will not have your way today. I will stay in the peace and the joy and the goodness of God. You will not take up space inside my mind, inside my head. You will not steal the, the, the fruit of the Spirit from me today. Not today. You are not entangling me up. But I'm telling you, He will keep trying. And He's been trying. And maybe, it, you know, for somebody that really loves God, the, the hardest day is the day after you fell for the entanglement. Because then you just feel like doggy dude. After sin comes fruition and it equals death. After sin comes fruition and it equals death. Yeah, spiritual man just feels like he just died. Anybody ever felt there? But I'm so thankful that 1 John 1 9 says he's faithful and just to forgive us of all my sin. That he washes me clean from all unrighteousness. 
Lord, I made a boo-boo. No, I didn't make a boo-boo. Lord, I sinned. Forgive me. Lord, I want to strangle my children, God. <laughs> and that is not the fruit of the Spirit. <laughs> Lord, help me. I repent. Children, I'm sorry I responded that way. Will you forgive that? Oh, yeah, we will. Okay. And then you can see they're wrestling with their own flesh. I can get by with this now. <laughs> no, you can't. I'm just not taking the bed. But you know, there's days that you stand, but it feels like you... Anybody ever got tripped up and given up your liberty? You just kind of want to... Sometimes if you're not careful, a spirit of depression will come in because that's what happens when you open that doorway. Once that doorway's cracked, the enemy just wants to come in like a flood. But the good news is when the enemy comes in like a flood, God says he'll raise a standard up against him. Amen? Stand therefore, therefore stand fast, and we're in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free. Now, it's nothing you've done to yourself. You can't power your way through it. Amen? You can't super your way through it. But you have to say, you know what? I am a new creature in Christ. Behold, all things have passed away. Behold, all things become new. 1 John 4, 4, what's it say? What? No, 1 John 4, 4. Come on. I'll make you work for it this morning. You're going to say, oh man, when you get there. What? First, read it. First John 4, 4. You have overcome him because greater is in he that is in you than he that is in the world. But how many times does he tell you when he comes? Listen, John 10.10, 10, the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But sometimes we think once we defeat alcohol, drugs, cussing, maybe even some sickness and those other things, we think we've defeated all the stuff that he's going to try to trip us up with and entangle us with. Those are just the big ones. He ain't even got started yet. He's going to try to get you with your attitude, your love walk. Come on, you with me? And they're going to steal your peace just as much if you went out and had a big old drink. I mean, the drink may make you feel more worse the next day. But... Oh, come on now. I'll stick with the Holy Ghost. Don't give me a hang Amen. Somebody look at your neighbor and said he made us free. He made us free. See, there's no doubt that he made us free. But how many times in a day when you're struggling with things, when he's trying to entangle you, is he trying to convince you you're not free from something? That something controls you and owns you. Now, one of the things for a guy is for something when you deal with things that are out of your control. That is hard. When you just don't have any control, you feel like you have no control over the situation. I'm not talking about being a control freak. I'm just talking about things that are happening that you just don't have any control over. It. And you gotta, you gotta learn. You feel like you gotta learn to roll with the punches. But you see, the enemy wants you to learn to roll with the punches. But God said, "Oh, gee, I told you to stay." There's things that I, don't, I can't figure out. I don't know how it is. And there's things I have no control over. And I've learned to be a much more patient man and loving man over the last little bit. When you got to depend on somebody for everything, you might as well learn to love them if it's more waiting. You're, you can either sit there and be upset or you can sit there and be happy. Amen. Either way, it's going to happen when it happens. Come on. But I've learned that I don't have to give up my joy, my peace. Is anybody with me today? I think I'm about to start preaching to the wall. Made us free and be not entangled again. Now, I'm so happy. Somebody look at your neighbor and say, he's talking to Christians. He said, those that are in Christ. In Christ. He said, be not entangled again. Would he tell you something if it wasn't possible? So, 
do you think maybe the devil uh, knows this? How many times does he beat you up because you got entangled in something? He's like, God told you not to do that. Look at you. you failure. You hypocrite. Want to be Christian? All you do is play church. Come on. Be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. How many know that God said His yoke is easy and His burden is light? And the truth is, if you do fall for this, there is a heavy yoke, and He ain't playing games, and He wants to take you back down to the pits of hell. And it's nothing to play with. But there is times you have to realize there's times He's going to try to entangle you. There's going to be times you're going to see the trap, you're going to feel the trap. You may be even in the trap, but even if you fall for it, there's a way out. But I'm here to, God, God will just tell you, listen, realize you're going to have to deal with this. Now, how many felt like once you got past the big stuff that you didn't have to deal with it so much anymore? Or maybe you didn't say it, but it's kind of just a thought in the back of your head. But let me tell you, every day he's trying to set you up with something. You're going to try to entangle. Now, there's a season where it's not as intense, but there's other seasons when you're about to break through into new things and, and you've gotten freedom and liberty and things. He says, watch this. Dad, this, hey, it's about to go. He's like, Lord, just let me go down and I'll show you who they really are. I can trip them up in two seconds. I'll get that flesh to shine through today. Just watch me, God. I like some that guy. I said, I'll, I'll take that bet. Go on. I know my kids. And I was reminded, I, I won't go into all of it, but, but uh, I, I won't even say his name, which one it was. But one of my children had done something, and it just crushed me. And this one had been in trouble a lot over the years, and I'd really been trying to refrain from spanking. I'd done lots of other things. I just I tried everything. And he did something so severe that I knew I was going to have to spank him. And he couldn't see what I was doing inside. But it was just killing me to have to spank him. And I gave it to him good because I'm talking things he did were very, very serious. And I wanted him to know you cannot do these things. But about halfway through, I was just, it was hurting me so bad, I was about, about to tears and I stopped and I had to, had to go on. And the Lord says, you see how hard that was to discipline him? He said, don't you think it's that hard on me when I have to discipline you? He said, if you know how to give good gifts unto your kids, how much better do I know how to give unto you? Now listen, Daddy, God will spank us. But He never does it out of a place of anger. It's always out of a place of correction. So even when you fall off the rail, even if He has to give you a spanking, it's never done how the enemy wants to portray it to you. God's never calling you a loser. God's never telling you to give up. He's telling you to pick it up, get back, get right. Come on. Get back after him. Some of my biggest spankings I ever had from God got the most growth out of me because I was like, I will never do that again. <laughs> and I'm not talking about even drinking. I'm just talking about there's things that I did. I, I look back now and I'm like, man, that was horrible. What was I thinking? And any man, he'll try to come and put shame on me. And I'll say, hey, not today. I can't say nothing. That is under the blood. You don't know here. God don't remember it. I ain't going to remember it either. And that guy died. And I crucified that flesh. And it's been on the cross since then. And that's not coming back. Amen? Amen. Amen. So don't be entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Now, how many know that God has, He says, put His yoke upon you, right? Well, that yoke is called grace. And can you, when you look it up into, into, the, into the Greek and the Hebrew, there's some of the Old Testament, we're not going to go through all that today, but it, it means like a necklace. Anybody ever had a light weight chain necklace on you? You don't even realize you're wearing it, do you? But it just makes you look good, don't it? Come on, some of you ladies help me out. It just makes you look good. And if it's the right one, it'll even kind of make you feel good sometimes. You know, you just have that, you got yourself all dolled up for that going out, you know, and, and it just makes you feel good. That is how the necklace, the grace of God, the yoke of God is. It just makes us look good and feel good. He said, in your weakness, my strength is made perfect through His grace. And the word grace means empowering you to change. Isn't that good news? He said, put your, my yoke upon you. Everybody wants to think they're creating one set of rules for another. No, you're not. 
you're giving up all the baggage. You're crucifying your flesh and you're picking up His necklace that's going to make you look good and feel good. Amen. And going to empower you to change. His, his yoke is easy. Come on, are you with me? Amen. And if you haven't tried it yet, I, I really suggest to switch on over. But what happens when you get entangled with some of this stuff? What happens when you, you get a little short with somebody? Or what happens even if fear comes in? Anybody ever had to deal with fear? God's not giving us a spirit of fear, power, love, and a sound mind. Sometimes you even tell somebody you get fearful, they quote you that scripture and say, You heathen, if you were a real man or woman of God, you wouldn't have no fear. Well, Without faith, it's impossible to please God. That's true. And fear is going to steal all your faith. And you're having... But I've never seen anybody help from beating on them. I can't say, listen, God gave every man a measure of faith. And you've got a measure of faith. You may not be exercising it right now. Come on, let me show you how to exercise it. Let me show you how to start growing that faith. Because listen, even the... there was a man in the Bible, I quote this a lot earlier, really. there's a man in the in the Bible that says, uh, he came to Jesus. He said, Lord, help thou my unbelief. That took a lot of faith to say, help thou my unbelief. There's times when you don't know. There's times I don't know how to do things. I don't know what to say. I don't know how to fix something, but I go to the guy that does. And he helps me. And he'll help you. Amen? Amen. But there is really a yoke of bondage. There, there's things that the enemy wants to put around your neck. And maybe it did used to be drugs, alcohol, drinking, all those things God delivered me from. Those are the big things he used to think of. But anymore, if he could get me, anybody, don't raise your hand, but we're living in the last days. Anybody ever dealt with the spirit of depression? It's from the pits of hell, and it's an entanglement that came to steal your joy, your faith, your peace. And enemies fighting for peace, but I'm so thankful that there's the opposite of that. But first it has to come. And, you, and sometimes you got to say, Lord, help me. I've got myself entangled all up in this. Because you know how you get depressed? You sure ain't thinking on, on good things. You're not thinking on positive things. He done wore you down. And he shot a million negative things inside your head. And you sit there and you thought about those things. Now there is times, I, I have, I'm going to tell you as a man of God, I've experienced other things. But sometimes I experience things other people are going through. So that I can intercede for them. I have had things just come upon me. I'm like, where did this come from? I defeated this years ago. I ain't been thinking on nothing, Lord. I ain't got no stinking thinking. I got my heart right. Why am I dealing with this? He said, well, because you're, you're doing battle with somebody else right now. Maybe you've never experienced that. Someday you will. So, Do you have a choice to be entangled? Yes. Do you have a choice to get out of being entangled? Yes. Are you brought, is the enemy probably going to try to entangle you sometime this week? Most definitely. He's probably already tried to, he probably already tried to entangle you when he got out of bed this morning. Why are you going to go to church? Ain't going to be nobody there. You know you ain't going to get nothing out of it anyways. Why do you get out of bed for him? Maybe he didn't say that. Maybe he just wanted, wanted you to sleep in. Everybody else gets to sleep in on Sundays, Lord. Just one Sunday for me. <laughs> Behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you be circumcised, Christ shall profit you none. You did run well. Who did hinder you? So you're running your race. Listen, the Bible says fight the good fight of faith. That means, come on. Faith is reaching over to the unseen realm where the promises of God are and bringing them into the seen realm. I'm, on, I'm doing Galatians 1 through 2, verse 7, 9 through 10, 13, 16, and 25. You'll be jumping around through Galatians 5 if you're trying to keep up with it. Ye did run well, who did hinder you that you should not obey the truth? Now, why do you think God worded it this way? Because after the enemy's tripped you up, he convinces that you're the dirty, no good, lousy heathen that just totally made a mess out of all this stuff. And God says, well, now, wait a minute. Yeah, you got entangled. Yeah, you, you've, your race has been hindered for a moment. But let's look at this a little deeper. Who hindered you? Satan, number one, Sometimes maybe you, 
but most likely it's the enemy first. But there is sometimes, I just want to throw it out there, like I say another, that it's you. You you did it. But he said, but he's he, he said it's it, I didn't ask for an impossible task. How many know the enemy wants to convince you that obeying the truth is really impossible? I mean that's just for somebody else to do. Would God ask you to do something and then make it impossible for you? He said, take my yoke upon you. My burden is light. Come on. You can't do it if you got the wrong yoke on. You ever seen horses try to pull something with the wrong yoke? They don't go very far. It's all about, even then, it's all about how they're hooked up and who, what they're hooked up to. You get two horses there that don't make, ain't, ain't supposed to be ain't running together, you're going to have a mess. <coughs> Some of you don't have no idea what I'm talking about. That's right. <laughs> well, how many know we we are to be yoked with the Lord? Because He can pull when we can. He can run when we can. When we run out of gas, He just started to get it. He's like, "Ooh, I'll take over from here." Ah. Come on. When the devil says, "I got you now," you say, "Man, not today." Have you seen my partner? Woo! just going to glide for a while. A little leaven leaven the whole lump. That means all it takes is a little bit of something to mess up a whole lot of good. And you need to be careful what you're letting in. You need to be careful what you're thinking on. You need to be careful what you're meditating on. You need to be careful what you're doing even. I'm not talking about being religious. Religious will never get you to heaven. I, I'm talking about, listen, the Bible says, let the peace of God rule your heart and mind, right? Where His peace starts to go, you should stop going also. And I don't care, it can just you can be dealing with situations and the enemy can be coming in like a flood and just bombarding you. And sometimes you may just have to say, you know what, I just give me a minute. I'm going to go talk to Daddy for a little bit. I'll be back. Because if you stay in that situation, you can feel things starting to overwhelm you. And you can feel the entanglement starting to set up. And you need to be wise as a serpent, harmless as a dove, and say, you know what, I recognize this for what it is. This is a trap from the pits of hell. Excuse me. And don't tell people that. They're going to look at you like you've got three heads. <laughs> but you can say, excuse me. I'll be back in a little bit. And you can go pray. Maybe you can turn on some worship music, read some word, pray in the Holy Ghost. Come on. Build yourself up in your most holy faith. Get your head right so you can go back in there and you can take authority over that thing instead of that thing overcoming you. But do not be naive. If you're not careful, those things can't entangle you. No one is above having to crucify their flesh. No one is above having to deal with these things, but we are more than an overcomer through Christ Jesus. He's already overcome. The battle's already here. We have to just stay in Christ. I mean, that teaching I taught on in death. But in order to stay in Christ, you, you can't fall for these entrapments and these entanglements. Amen? Amen. Who did hinder you? Little eleven, eleven old. I have confidence in you through the Lord. Guess what? Paul had confidence in you, so do I. I got confident in that if you'll stay in Christ, you're going to be more than an overcomer. That you will be none otherwise minded. That means he's going to start in your mind. Do you realize that? He said, if you're otherwise minded, he may you let something else take over your head other than the Word of God and what it says in the promises. I mean the promises of God are yes and amen. They're not maybe could have, should have, would. But if you're honest, some days when you've been... Anybody ever dealt with something for a long period of time? Those are some of the hardest things because it just grinds you down. And wears you down. And you're like, you may have started off like a gangbuster, but maybe after quite some extended time, uh, if you're honest with yourself and somebody else, you'd go, well, I'm to maybe right now. And that's when you need to get some help from the Lord, from other believers. You know what? Hey, Lord, you said, you said help thou my unbelief, right? I mean, there's nothing wrong with asking God for help. Lord, I see where I'm, I'm getting wore down here. How I many you know that the Bible plainly says Satan's job is to wear down the saints? 
but we're all so surprised when we find ourselves there. If somebody told, hey, listen, I, and there was once in my life, I'm going to be honest with you, I'll talk about something else for a minute. I love being in the glory of God. I absolutely love it. I love to be walking in joy, peace, meekness, love, and having that oozing out of every pore. And someday, I, I plan to have my flesh so under wraps that I can do that maybe 90% 90, 90 of the time, if I'm being honest. But I'm not there yet. I, I, I'm, I'm about a 50-60 or something right now, a 40-60. I know I gave myself 10% extra on my side. I got the Holy Ghost. But if I'm being honest, come on, I'm not quite there yet, but I used to beat myself up because I didn't stay there 24-7. Is anybody really hearing me this morning? If I didn't stay just walking in that powerful anointing that just knocked the socks off everybody, including myself, I would just belittle myself to no end. Because I wasn't where everybody needed me to be 24-7. And I didn't allow myself to ever be human because human was of the devil. Come on now, I'm preaching this morning. Now listen, we do need to walk in holiness. We do need to walk in the anointing. But he said, crucify your flesh daily. Now how do I do it? By staying in Christ, making choices. But there's going to be time, there's entanglements and things. Well, I'm going to have to work on them. And he, 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 he knew we would. He put it in the Word of God. Are you? I'm not giving you an excuse for getting yourself into messes. I'm telling you don't beat yourself up when the enemy brings the things he's going to bring and you're walking through them. Because then he brings, even if you don't fall for it, he's still trying, then he'll work on you to get you in a spirit of depression. Just because you didn't pass it the way you thought you should have. Come on, anybody hear me this morning? Yeah. Starting to sound like that old Baptist preacher. Go ahead, come on. You ain't shot. Wish I could get up. <laughs> but he that troubleth you shall bear his judgment, whosoever he be. For brethren, you have been called unto liberty. Only use not liberty for an occasion to the flesh. See, the Lord, he's like, listen, he gave you all that, but then he said, listen, but don't use that excuse to go out there and live like a heathen. I believe since we ate of the fruit of good and evil in the Garden of Eden, Eden, I believe that we know when we're in the flesh and out of the flesh, if we're really honest with ourselves. And if you've got to start off with five million excuses about why you're doing something, you too already know why you're in the flesh. And I'm telling you the fastest way to freedom is just giving it to God and let Him be who He is in your life. Because He's already made you more than an overcomer. I've helped thousands of people probably deal with drugs and other things, overcoming things I come from. And the greatest thing is they keep trying to get something they already got and God already made it for them. He already broke the addiction. But if the enemy, but the enemy can trip you up into opening that door back up, and then He comes in with seven more worse than the one you had, and then He makes life living hell. But even then, you can get, you can call upon the name of the Lord, and He shall make you free. Yeah. But anybody in there ever ha had a poopy attitude, and you do it? <laughs> I mean, just you're downright ugly. I mean, and the world we live in, you know, sometimes you can just go through the drive-through, and you got to be prayed up. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. When I call a and AT and T, I have I got a fax sometimes. <laughs> you know, it's just. Has anybody ever tried to deal with our medical system? No. You better be prayed up. I know some of y'all work there. And you're like, oh, <laughs> God put you in there to help some people. He knew we would kill them. <laughs> Glory. You have been called unto liberty. Somebody look at your neighbor and say liberty. liberty. How many likes the idea of being free? Yeah. Free in joy, free in peace, free in love. Come on. He, he didn't say you're not going to go through things, but he said, listen, I've set you free from those things controlling you. 
Only use not your liberty for an occasion to the flesh, but by love serve one another. And we talked about this some last week. It's better to give than receive. Yeah. Come on. You know, when you're at your worst, that's when you need to go give to somebody else and minister. Because it just makes you feel better. That's how the Word of God works. Amen? But has anybody ever... Listen, this spirit of entanglement, it's really... It also works right along. Entanglement works right along with the spirit of entitlement. The spirit of entanglement works right along... Come on. I'm going a little deeper with you this morning. With the spirit of entitlement. Because you usually get entangled because you feel entitled to something that was either stolen from you, took from you, or was done wrong to you. Amen. Or something that you should have gotten. Or something that was just not done right. But even then, in the most, if the, even if it was a... There's all kinds of things that happen that we don't understand. But how many of God's ways aren't our ways? His thoughts aren't our thoughts. Come on. But Romans 8.28 says, All things work together... For all those who give a high tithe. <laughs> For all those that love God that are called according to His purpose. Now He didn't say all those that just show up at church. He said those that love Me that are letting My purpose work in their life. Come on. And so He said He's going to work them out for your good. But how many times we buy into that? Anybody ever like, that's just not fair. <laughs> Do you know that's a spirit of entitlement? I hate to break that to you. Because you feel like something was stole from you. But if you really believe that God is a good God, that's got good things for you, you're not going to fall for that lie. And you're not, because the enemy wants to steal that thing from you. He wants to steal the very promise of God that you're standing on. Come on. He, will, he wants to get you upset so he can get you to open that door and step outside that covering. So that he could really get you on the ropes and work on you. And that's what happens with the spirit of entanglement. His whole thing, he cannot touch you when you're in Christ. He can just throw fiery darts at you. And he wants to trip you up to open the door so that he can get you out there and just start really beating the tar out of you. And I came to tell you today that just because he's trying does not mean that you have and you do not have to fall for that and beat yourself up for that. And you're in good company if you're dealing with one because I think most believers are dealing with one at this moment in time. Come on, I'm just being real up here this morning. I, I know it's a little different. Y'all still with me? Yeah. I got like 15 minutes. Come on. I've only got through the first few verses. But by love serve one another. Notice it didn't say duty. When you love somebody or something, you don't do it because you have to. You do it because you want to. But He told us to love one another as He has loved the church. I mean, He did lay down His life for us. And when you start learning to put up, it takes a while to crucify your flesh to get this point. I'm talking from experience. But when you start esteeming others higher than yourself, it takes a whole level of entanglement off the door. It takes a whole level of entitlement off the door. When you start loving others the way that Christ loved them, it, it, just, it just alleviates a whole plague for you. Are you going to be perfect at it when you start? No. Is it always going to be easy? No. Are you going to be tempted to slap him upside the head? Yes. Hey, come on now. Crucify your flesh daily. What is your flesh? Anger. Come on. We can read them all here down here later on this verse. I have to go there. I don't have them in my notes. But He said, This I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now, to walk in the Spirit, the Bible says be full of the Holy Ghost. You're full of the Holy Ghost. The Bible says evidence of speaking in tongues. That's which every time we see them lay on hands, you see them start speaking in tongues. They said if you want the Holy Ghost, he said lay hands on them and they shall receive. Amen. They said, they said have you received the Holy Ghost yet? They said, no, we got Jesus. They said, well, let's lay hands on you and get the Holy Ghost. That's all in Acts. I can give you all. we got some books in the back that I put together. But, uh, 
How many know it's important to have the Holy Ghost? Why? Because He speaks in a heavenly language and He can fill the Lord in and get you refilled in, your spirit tuned up in a few minutes what would take you all day. It's a one-on-one -on -one connection. You, you know, if you don't have heavy enough gauge, you can't pull that much current. And the Holy Ghost is like putting a super booster on your spirit, man. And you can fill that dude up quick and powerful. Otherwise, you're stuck on a triple charger and you, if you do any kind of thing to exert yourself, you feel it. In my opinion, that's the difference of being filled and not filled with the Holy Ghost. Is non-filled people going to make heaven? Absolutely. Some of them got better character than all spirit-filled folks I know because they work diligently on lining up with the Word of God. But if you want to be superpowered, you, you can walk and do this kind of walk and walk through these things, it's going to take the power of the Holy Ghost. Because then he says, when you, listen, he says it right, this I say, walk in the Spirit and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. Now listen, your flesh wants things. I mean, this weekend at Dunkin' Donuts, it's a, buy one, one dozen and get another dozen free, you know. My flesh man said, let's, no, not Dunkin', it was Krispy Kreme. He said, let's go to Krispy Kreme. It's free donuts. I know, look, I just talked to all y'all, so tell y'all have to practice. I'm trying to set you up. I'm entangling you right now. Self-control. Yeah, that's fruit of the Spirit, Amen. Walk in the Spirit, you should not fulfill the lust of the flesh. If you live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Listen, if you're led by the Spirit of God, He's going to lead you around probably 90% of the entanglements. I believe there's still some that you're going to have to walk through because God's wanting to grow you and stretch you some things. But if you listen to the Holy... He gets me out of so much stuff. About like, he's just really smart. No, I'm not. I just learned to listen to the Holy Ghost, stay prayed up. And when he says go left, I go left. When I go, he says go right, I go right. When he says don't do something, I say okay. There's sometimes I'm like, well, I don't understand why you wouldn't let me do that. He's like, I know. While later something happened, oh, well, I'm glad I didn't do that. Well, I'm glad I stood in faith with that. If I'd have done what they wanted, I wouldn't be up here with my whole leg still today. Lord. I had a whole bunch of other verses, but uh, coming up on time, I only did those. So, let's see here. Verse 19. Now the works of the flesh are manifest, where are, are these? Adultery. Not only do we have adultery anymore, and listen, I've known a lot of people that are homosexual. I've led a lot of them to the Lord, and I've got I've seen them get set free from it. And they hate this anymore. The spirit of deception has gotten so much, but it, to me, it's no different than a drug addict or any other person that's bound by something. And I'm not going to leave them bound. Why am I going to leave this person bound? So it's their choice who you love. Well, if it's sending them to hell, and I didn't write the Bible, if the Bible's true in one area, it's true in every area. But how I many you know God loves them the same much way as He loves us, the same way He loves the drunk? And He has plans for them, right? Have you ever won somebody to Christ by beating them over the head with a two by four? You know how I won most of the Lord? They, they, they like to do shock and awe and try to trip you up. So that's their whole thing. They, are, they really believe that most Christians are just evil people who just hate their guts. And so they just try to get you to act that way. Hey, when you really love others and serve others, guess what? You don't have to worry about being tripped up and entangled by that because you're just going to treat them the same way you treat everybody else. And someone said, we don't fear up, man. He said, go into highways and byways and compel them to come. If somebody's bound by something, they need to know that Jesus is real, loves them, has plans for them. You know? Do you tell the drunk to stop leaving, leave the bottle at home before you come to the altar? Man, they can't leave the bottle alone or they wouldn't need a Savior. Amen. They need to come to the altar to get set free and delivered. Amen. You don't tell the drug addict, say, when you get through with rehab and you get all that stuff under control, then you can come to church. <laughs> no. You say, come as you are. I know the delivery. Luke 4.18 says he come to set the captives free. 
How many people there know that are in that? They're they're captive to that thing. That thing owns them. Amen. They are entangled all up in that thing. Amen. But aren't we glad that we know the deliverance? Yes. Fornication. You can't even turn on the TV no more. I spend more time bouncing my head. I got to turn it off. Uncleanliness, lasciviousness. I just talking nasty. When people start off telling me, I probably shouldn't say this around you, I say, well, then no. <laughs> you already knew you shouldn't have. Then they go. <laughs> adultery. How many know it, adult, adultery can be a lot of things? I've seen people, that, they, parents today, actually parents 20 years ago taught them that, now there's hardly nobody in church unless people went out and got them and they had to really come to them. Jesus moment is they teach them that they teach them that church is something we do when we have spare and extra time. They go to the lake, they go to the ball games, they go sorry, I didn't listen to the lake when I tried. Not thinking about you, I'm saying. <laughs> but you know, they they teach them that everything else is more important than God. I mean the Bible says train up the way a child should go. When he's older, he will not depart from him. You know, you know, we only got him for such a short amount of time. And if we don't teach him what's important now, they'll never know. Right? But what, what is the most... There, there was a time that maybe even my motorcycle might have been up in there. But man, it's so far... It, it's a tool. And everything, every gift I have from God is a tool, but I treat them as that. They are a tool in my arsenal to win people to Jesus Christ. I control them, they don't control me. My wife is a gift from God. That's what James says. But she's a gift from God, but she's not my God. And God comes first in my life. Matter of fact, I told her once that she preached on it here one time. I didn't realize how much it affected her. I told her, you'll always be second place to me. And I guess she would have to take that for a while. <laughs> Witchcraft. Hatred. You know, when people say things like, I, I love them, I don't hate them, but I don't like them, and I, don't gotta, I ain't got to like what they did. I hate to break it to you, that's still hatred. Just because you say you don't hate them, if you can't look at them and feel the love of Christ in your heart, then you still have <coughs> hatred in your heart. I used to put it this way. Well, how do I know if I see them out? Well, if you see them and you don't want to cross the other side of the street, you're starting to do pretty good. Come on. Now, I'll tell you what, there's times that there have been people that when the Lord put me to the test and Amy tried to entangle me with that, and they'd be walking straight up to me. I'm like, oh, Lord, don't worry. Don't, I don't want to talk to them, God. He said, no, but I want you to talk to them. Not only do I want you to talk to them, I want you to minister to them. Yes, Lord. And then when it gets done, you're like, you're like, woo, I passed. I felt pretty good. Let's go do it again. Not really. <laughs> Come on, are y'all with me this morning? Yeah. Variants, simulations, wrath. Now, do you know that you can control your emotions? Does everybody know that? When I was a young man growing up, and if someone say, well, you're biologically this way, there is traits that come up with us, but guess what they're in? There's something called our flesh. But we're learning here where we get the Spirit of God and it overrules our flesh. Right? Man, I had a temper like nobody's business, and so did my dad. I, man, I would, I, would, I would fly off the head. I would black out. When I come to, it was usually a bloody mess somewhere. It was bad. And my pastor, Pastor Bobby Robinson, He's went on to be the Lord a long time ago now. I was probably a little over Isaiah's age. And I just remember he was late one night in his truck. He pulled me in. I think Mom had called him for something because she thought I was going to murder the neighborhood or something. I don't know. I'd gotten a fight with about four or five of them. One, and it was, it was bad. And I think the parents wanted to press charge. I don't remember what all it was. was. He was there for several different times for several different reasons. Uh, but he had, I still remember something, and my dad had the temper like that and everything, and he was, it was horrible childhood before mom left him, and, and uh, he looked at me and he said, son, 
He said, I used to have the same thing. And I didn't know that he'd grown up a lot like I did, which is funny as I think about things today. He'd grown up kind of without a dad and that and his temper and that. He said, but if you don't learn to control this now, it's going to control you all your life. You know, and, and he, he gave me scripture to stand on and all that, but that, that saying, it was scripture. You see, he's saying what is said here today, but he put it in a way that a young boy could understand. And today, if you don't learn to control that fear, if you don't learn to control that depression, if you don't learn to control that thing that's trying to overcome you, it's going to control you. But if you'll stay in the Spirit, you won't fulfill those things. But guess what? He said, if you will. That means you have a choice. That means you're gonna, there's some days you're going to have to fight for it. There's some days you're going to have to fight the good fight of faith. You have to say, listen, God said that my weapons are mighty and carnal, pulling down strongholds. So I don't care what the doctor said. Someone say, you're naive. I want to believe God's report because either here or heaven, He's going to restore me. But either way, it's going to be done. There's no ifs, ands, buts about it. But I am contending for here. And I will not stop fighting. And you don't stop fighting. And you don't stop becoming a better person and quit beating yourself up every time <laughs> that you slip up. Just, just learn from it and do better next time. And I'm not talking about repeat. There's a Bible, there is another verse that he used to really wail on me with. But instead of, I learned you stop using it to wail on, I use it to grow. And it says, as a fool is to his folly, so as a dog is to his vomit. Have you ever seen a dog? I hate to be gross, but this is scripture. When they, when they puke something up, they go and clean it up for you. And that's how a fool is to his father. So many, if you're that and you just keep on making a mess, puking and going right back to it, clean it up and going right back to it, you need to be set free from that thing. But even, and there was a time that I had to be set free from some things and, it, and that verse was convicting me. And then there was a season after it, convict, that, after it convicted me that I'd overcome that the enemy tried to condemn me if I ever even wasn't super Christian. And he tried to tell me that that verse was me again. And it took me a little while to get a grasp on it. Come on, are you hearing me this morning? It took me. And some days, guess what? I still got to get a grasp. Because, man, listen, if I don't always hit 100%, I'm, a, I'm hard on myself. You, you probably can ask my wife, and she can tell when I'm really dealing with something. I get quiet, don't I? And I'm not, I don't do a lot of talking until I come through on the other side, you know. Then I'm good. But I want to encourage you today, some of you have just been beating on yourself too much. And I'm not telling you to, to sin and those things, but I'm telling you to embrace the, the necklace and the grace of God and let it do the work as you stand in faith as God is setting you free. As long as if you stand, you say, listen, how, how many in here, well, listen, it's something I'll overcome. And don't raise your hand, you know. But how many in here have a temper? How many in here has your temper got the best of you? How many in here felt like doggy doo do after? Nobody won. How many felt the love of God after you repented? And how many made a decision inside yourself? You got me there, but I'm, I'm not going to bite for that bullet again. See, that's called being a mature Christian. That's called growing in Christ. Now, for those that are not watching online, I didn't always do that. There are some periods in my life that it was a wrestle. I thought, dear Lord, am I ever going to get a grip on this thing? And all of a sudden, one day, I realized I had a grip on it, and it wasn't gripping me no more. Amen. And we were working on something else. Of course, a few late years later, he started working on it again. I'm like, I thought we already did this. I thought I was doing pretty good. He said, you were, but not at this level. <laughs> In our ministry, we've seen the dead raised, people deaf healed. We, I, I've seen all tumors fall off. Man, I, I, I thought we'd seen miraculous things. And then the season we're in now, I'm like, I don't understand what you're doing. And we still have people come in and get healed. I'm so I'm so happy about Sister Bonnie. We don't talk about it much, but she's a 
walking miracle of the goodness of God when all those things happen. And uh, and we, we can go on and on in here. People that's overcome those things. Well then, Pastor, my I used to have to deal with all that. Matt, Somebody needs to know. Maybe he's working on me. Maybe I the enemy just hates my guts. But I'm still more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. And listen, I'm not trying to talk about me building me up. If I talk about me, nobody gets offended. If I start using you all, everybody's going to get upset. <laughs> Strife. Has anybody ever... I want you to just... You can just put this beside strife if you write in your Bible. Take notes. I want you to put drama. <laughs> drama. You ever been around anybody that I call them pot stirrers? They don't stay around me very long to stay in time. I don't still put up with it. I'm a no drama zone. I got a life is hard and things are difficult enough. But how many know people that have that strife that he set free from? Yep. They need delivered from. It. Their whole life evolves around it. They actually don't even know how to function without it. But has anybody ever got caught up in stuff? You ever been around somebody and the tension's so tight you can cut a knife with it because there's just strife between you? Well, you know what that is. That means somebody has something they haven't let go of. Big strife. And it usually takes two. So that means it'd be you too. I'm not beating you up. I'm just telling you that is an entanglement that the enemy uses a lot in these days. Are you with me? I mean, it was easy when it was just drugs, right? So we say, it ain't easy with drugs. Let me tell you what. After I got clean, I've been clean, I guess, going on 25 years now. And got set free from all those things. I used to, I mean, he instantly said to hurting drugs. And that was all difficult. I mean, I know it's a season. I look back, sometimes just working on my character has been way harder than any of that. And I still realize I talk sometimes like some kind of hood or like a biker, I guess. I, I say things to my children and I just think, man, somebody heard me. And I say them to you all. And I'm like, good Lord, it's good thing you all know me. And I've had a few people come and I tried to change for a while. I tried to get proper, but I can't change who I am. I mean, I can more like the image of Christ. But you know, when you pour Coke through a Coke bottle, it tastes like Coke, you know. I tell you, I'm going to slap the taste out of your mouth. I'm really not going to slap you no more. <laughs> it's just a metaphor. <laughs> but I found some people got in top together. They got intimidated by that. And I realized they probably wasn't called to, I wasn't called to be their pastor. Because those that I'm called to, they know my heart. <laughs> Various simulations, right, rash, strife, sedations, envies, murders. I'll just stop on envy for a minute. Anybody ever tried to keep up with the Joneses? How miserable did you get? Anybody ever get, you know, there was a season of my, I love to see get people get blessed anymore. I love, I want to see people more blessed than me. That just makes me happy. But I have to admit, if I look back, there was a season when God was working on me when that was not so. I was wondering when only good things happen to those kind of people, good things never happen to me. What is that the life in the pits of hell? It's trying to tell me that I'm less than. It's just believing who God says I am. And I didn't really get nothing good until I started believing who God said I was. Come on. I'm a king's kid. I'm a co heir with Christ. Woo! Glory! I can have what He says I have. I can have. Luke chapter 11, 22 through 24 says, Whose servants have having faith? What server they ask? Come on. Maybe sometimes your asker has been broken. Well, that's good. You'll have to fix, fix your broken asker. <laughs> have to fix your broken I'm almost there. Come on. Drunkenness, revelings, and such, of which I tell you before, as I have also told you in time past. Now listen. Drunkenness. You know, just because we make something legal doesn't mean that we make it more. The Word of God is what I live by. If I decided, if I let the rest of society decide for me what's moral, I'm going to, I'm going to live in a, in a constant heartache and turmoil. But when I search the Word of God for myself and I decide what is moral according to the Word of God, I start work, walking more of His peace, more of His joy, 
because there's a reason why those things are all entanglements. Those are things that in, in, in the Bible, someone said, well, I had fun for a little bit. Well, the Bible says there's pleasures for a season. But let me tell you, I was out there long enough that I realized every one of those seasons ended in misery. But the Bible says there's pleasures forevermore at the right hand of the Father. Come on, how many, how many have tried it? It's good stuff. But, how I many don't listen? Everybody, everybody wants to argue about this, but he plainly says you're not going to make heaven. And, and, and then I've had people that, were de that are dealing with drunkenness and somebody was trying to beat on them and it wasn't me. And they say, yeah, well, I've seen you around and you ain't been very nice either. And he said, you ain't going to make heaven either with a temper like yours. Woo! Then they, then they got offended in religious, you know. Or I've had them tell me, well, you're fat. And gluttony, you will not make heaven. I said, well, there's a difference between gluttony and fat, but I'd have to teach you about how the body works first. It's called metabolism. I'm but if you feel that way, you come live with me for a few days, and then and you give up your drinking, and I'll show you what I eat, and then we'll have a Jesus talk. Mm -hmm. You don't know why took me up on that, but a lot of them did come to know Jesus. Why? Because they, if you, if they can justify it, they don't have to deal with it. And if you're having to justify something, you're on the wrong side of the fence. That's just for you. Romans, of which I tell you before, as I've also told in time past, they that which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Now, you know what? Used to, this put the fear of God in people. I watch today, and it don't phase nobody. You say, you're not going to inherit the kingdom of God. Oh, well, I need enough, I believe, in that stuff. It's funny. You know, I've been around atheists on their deathbed. They're praying like nobody's business. And they come to know Jesus. Because when you're in dire need, your spirit man inside you recognizes, I've got to get right with God. And sometimes you have a Damascus Road experience. Sometimes you're completely out of church, living like hell, doing everything you ain't, and all of a sudden your spirit man goes, if you don't change, we're going to die! And all of a sudden, it starts drawing you back. But the fruit of the Spirit is this. What are you supposed to be producing? What is He trying to trip you up in? Love. I ain't talking about that ooey-gooey, Valentine Cupid kind of love. I'm talking, real love costs you something. Real love ain't easy. Real love is about commitment. You make a choice, and you stick with it. I mean, you know, God made a choice to stay on the cross and He stuck with it. But then He went down to hell and got the keys of death, hell, and the red grave and rose again on the third day so that we could be free. I mean, you know, we started off with this, there's freedom in Christ, right? How many like being free? How many would like to go throughout the day and this weekend going happy, happy, happy? I'm happy, happy, happy. You say, what happened to you? I thought you had all this stuff going on. I do, but I, I know this guy named Jesus. And I decided to give it to him for the weekend. Come on. Love, joy. Now listen, we talk about joy and we have a spirit of laughter that happens right here a lot. Has anybody ever seen anybody joyful that didn't laugh? So how can you have that spirit without it? How about peace? How many like peace? I'm wrapping up my first closing. Peace. He wants your peace. And I have to say, sometimes I give it to Him. But then I go back and give it. Come on, are you with me? Long-suffering. Man, I used to hate that verse. But you know what? It's pretty beautiful when that, because it means that when I really start operating it, it takes a lot longer for them to give my good. It takes a lot longer for me to bite. And the longer I serve him, the better I get him. What's that mean? It means all that entanglement stuff don't work so well on me because I'm operating in that spirit of long suffering. I know who my God is. <laughs> he said, the violent take it by force. Come off. 
Sometimes you just got to reach out there and grab a hold of that thing. Let the captives free. Gentleness. I used to not. Would you say most people in the world today are the opposite of gentleness? And, but the thing is, is the world and the enemy tries to convince you that gentleness is weakness. When it's actually a strength. You know, I've diffused more situations because I didn't used to. Used to, I was a fireball. But I've diffused more situations with gentleness, meekness, and kindness. But I just go, hey, how you doing? Because the Bible says, if you're railing for railing, you're going to devour one another. I decided long ago I don't get heated matches. I don't. As a matter of fact, when you get to a point you're arguing, I think it drives past the tent crazy. We don't argue as much anymore. But I just stop talking. Start praying. I ain't got nothing left to say. Gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance against such there is no law. They that are Christ have crucified the flesh with the affections and lusts. You don't have to still crucify the flesh, even daily. But you get a choice which one rules you. You get a choice which one lives in you. And when you mess up, you've got a Savior, a savior that died to redeem you. It's going to wash you clean and get you back on the right path. And the more you choose that, the more you're going to grow in that. And as you grow in that, it's going to be what's ruling in your life. And all of a sudden, it's going to be that faith and, and hope's going to start blooming in you. And it's going to start manifesting outside your life. And people will say, there's something different about you. What's, what's going on? You going to church? Man, I ain't just going to church. I met Jesus. I fell in love with him. He saved me and life had changed my life. I ain't never going to be the same again. He said, just watch this. I'm going to get your goat. Oh, man. I'm going to practice it for you. I know you're coming. I ain't going to fall for that again, stupid. He said, I got more. I don't care. God warned me about you. I know you're coming. But all I got to do is concentrate and stay in the Spirit of God. I ain't got to worry about your plans. I ain't got to worry about your hang-ups. I ain't got to worry about your trip-ups. I ain't got to be consumed with what you're doing next. I just got to stay in the Spirit and the glory of God. When I get out of the glory, I just go, Lord, help me. I put back on His grace necklace, and I jump back in. Because the water is just fine. But if that's you this morning, I want to encourage us all just to start swimming a little deeper bit of the pool of the freedom of God. And uh, because I believe we're going to need it in these last times. Pastor Tim, if you'd come again and uh, close us in prayer, take prayer requests, pray over people.